Good morning, everyone. And uh, so nice to see everyone this morning um, for our second uh, in three classes on um, inequity in Chicago public schools. Um, our last class in this uh, uh, course is going to be next week at 930. Um, and then today and sub subsequent Sundays, we also have classes on foundations of faith an hour with the Bible and fourth church clergy on Sundays at 1230. Uh, I'm Ira Pilchin, by the way, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a member of the uh, church's uh, adult education committee, uh, which puts on these programs with great assistance from other committees uh, throughout the church. And we'll get to that in a bit. Um, I put in the chat a, a link to um, our um, portion of the church's website that has the descriptions of the adult education classes. So feel free to look at that at some point or copy that and uh, visit it later. It's, uh, it, it's under the um, um, uh, Academy of Faith and Life section on the church's website. So we hope you can join us for subsequent classes as well. And then also on um, Tuesday, October 6th, there's gonna be a forum on the Illinois graduated tax amendment uh, with a special emphasis on the impact on education. Uh, that's 7 p.m. Tuesday, October 6th. I posted a link to the Zoom registration for that as well. Uh, that was organized as, as well as this course was uh, organized uh, with a lot of help from the Church's Action for Equitable Education Committee. Um, Janet Bulk is with us, and I believe Claudia Jackson might be with us as well. Uh, they head up that committee. So if you're interested in these issues, working on these issues uh, through the church, um, I think they will, one of them will post their contact information in the chat um, if you haven't contacted them already. So um, that's it for that. Today's speaker, we're very glad to have with us the Chief Equity Officer of Chicago Public Schools, and that's Maurice Swinney. Uh, Dr. Swinney is the district's first Chief Equity Officer, and he's responsible for moving us closer to achieving educational equity, which is a moral imperative for CPS. Uh, in his role, Maurice examines our policies and programs for inequities and implements strategies that minimize gaps in resources, staffing, and high quality academic programming. Uh, Dr. Swinney comes to us from Louisiana, where he was an educator there uh, before he came over to CPS. So we're very thrilled to have him. Last week, um, our session with Derek Dawson um, is, has, was recorded along with this week's session, and the link for that is posted to the Adult Education uh, Academy for Faith and Life website. So if you want to see that again or refer other people to that presentation, we'll post this session as well. So for those of us, or, or for anyone who wants to join us for next week, they can watch, and if they haven't weren't with us for one or two weeks, they can watch those as well. So if you could spread the word on that, we'd really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Swinney will take questions. Um, and as we did last week, we find it most manageable in this setting to, um, if you could post your questions in the chat function, it can even be a summary of your question, because then if it is a question, I will call on you to, um, to expand upon your question and announce it to the group. If you are, I don't know if anyone is just on the phone, but if you are just on the phone and you don't have access to the chat, then just as we take questions, feel free to just break in and we'll accommodate you the best we can. So before we start with Dr. Swinney, uh, we'll start with a prayer and then we'll go on to our presentation. So again, thank you all for joining us. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, we meet yearning for understanding of our broken world and what we can do to fulfill the needs and hopes of all your children, our brothers and sisters, our children. Watch over and lift up our teachers, our school district leaders and staff, and all who urge us and lead us to make your beloved community 
our reality. Amen. And now on to Dr. Swinney. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, glad to be here. Spend time with you this Sunday morning. Um, I am Marie Sweeney, Chief Equity Officer um, here in Chicago Public Schools. Um, this is my second, I just completed two years in the role, and um, this is my 20th year in public education. Um, former English teacher, assistant principal, associate principal, that was a ninth grade principal in a large high school, um, high school principal, and now Chief Equity Officer. I'm pretty excited. Um, I still maintain a sense of high energy for the role. Um, I recently completed my doctorate um, in education at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa. Um, I had actually started uh, my doctoral program years ago and then I stopped um, due to Hurricane Katrina and then I started again and then I stopped during Hurricane Gustav. And so there were these, um, I'll call it the roller coaster ride of life. Um, and when my father passed away in uh, January, 2016, before he passed away, um, he told me to finish school because he said, that's what you really wanted. And so it was a motivation for me to go back to complete my doctorate. It's, and I recently got the hard copy here in the mail. So I, it's like one of those, I just keep near me every time I sit down. Um, it's been a long, it's, it was a long ride, but I'm, I'm happy to um, complete it. And my, di my dissertation was on the relationship factors between parents, guardians, and re-enrollees who graduate or drop out a second time. I was really trying to understand um, what do relationships look like? What are the nuances in relationship that help to um, advance um, education? And what are the things that potentially stifle it? And one of the, I'm working on turning this into some articles and, and things right now, because there was so much great information from learning um, and sitting and talking with families. Um, so I'm excited to just share some things with you. I always over-prepare. So there will be, um, at some point, Ira, please feel totally free to cut me off and say, hey, let's move to questions because I really want to be responsive to um, what people are wondering about the work in Chicago Public Schools. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I am going to, and so you'll probably um, see my screen. Let's see, from the very beginning, so I'm gonna speed back. Um, I am always thankful and grateful when people share space. Can everybody see the screen? Give me a thumbs up if yeah. you can. Okay, great, yep. thank you. Um, I'm always thankful and grateful when people give me the opportunity to speak. I know time is precious. Um, and so I always wanna do my due diligence by not wasting people's time, but by sharing important information um, that helps people to understand what's happening in Chicago. And so please drop your questions in the chat as we go along. So I am me and here is my team. I have a great team of great um, individuals um, who are really helping to drive the work in Chicago Public Schools. I say we're a small but mighty team. Um, my core team is at the top, my intern squad is at the bottom and we're actually adding more interns to the Office of Equity. One of the things that we recognize is by having um, Brilliant interns to be a part of this work expands um, the reach of the Office of Equity and helps people to stay connected to what's happening within the organization. Um, I know we've lost so many great people um, and I hold um, John Lewis very dear to my heart. And he says, we must find a way to get in trouble. We must find a way to get in the way, get in good trouble, necessary trouble. You have a moral obligation, a mission and a mandate when you leave here to go out and seek justice for all. You can do it, you must do it. And we know we also lost our beautiful um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a powerful woman uh, in, the, in the work of social justice and civil rights. And so I always like to give a moment of silence for those who've given their lives to ensure equity before we were calling it equity within our country. With that, we hold the, the truth that Black Lives Matter. We hold the quote of James Baldwin that says, people are trapped in history and history trapped in them. And when you look at the picture of George Floyd, you also see the history of racism in this country as it goes back for 400 years. And we believe in Chicago Public Schools, it is important to prioritize racial equity 
recognizing that all forms of equity, there are people of color who are farthest from opportunity, and we must have a great focus on ensuring that, um, that young people are getting the opportunities that they need to thrive, not only um, within our city, but in our country. We encourage people to vote. We don't say who you should vote for, but we believe that we don't, if we don't have the liberty and take the voice, um, our votes, we don't have an opportunity to speak up. It is important that people vote, um, that we exercise our civil rights, we, that we exercise our democratic rights in this process. We also promote um, sending love to people who are in the medical, uh, medical sphere right now. They are dealing with a lot. I know you probably have seen videos and reports. So I always say, if you know people who are working in the medical field and in hospitals, just send some love, text messages to them. Um, the middle picture of the sign um, that says, thank you. Actually, one of my former students created that picture um, um, in Louisiana. And so he won a, a great prize for that. And it's, it's on murals and billboards everywhere. So I like to give a shout out to him. And we just encourage people to wash their hands and just to operate in good faith to make sure all people are safe. So when the Office of Equity opened in um, September, October, fall 2016, I mean 2018, excuse me, um, one of the first, Janice, Dr. Jackson gave me three charges. One, um, that she wanted me to participate in the co-creation of a CPS five-year vision, that she wanted a CPS equity framework to help us to think about how we do this work, and that we increase um, and do better at stakeholder engagement, really involving um, stakeholders, parents, guardians, caregivers, community advocates, et cetera, in this work of advancing equity in Chicago public schools. Um, Dr. Jackson's vision uh, started, this is the first office of equity within the city, and it's helping to give shape and frame to the work of equity offices, not only in the city, but around the country. So I want you to take a look at this. I'm gonna give you a second to look at this slide, and I will, I'll give you a second to look at the one behind it. When we think about equity, we're looking at the individual, the interpersonal, the institutional, and structural levels. So individual meaning, what's my role in this? What's my personal role? How am I showing up in, 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 um, in front of people every day? The interpersonal, which is about how am I interacting and engaging with others? institutional, what are the structures and barriers that keep um, the tax or burden one particular community and um, provide opportunities and resources for others? And what are the structural things that need to be moved? I'm sorry. Um, I think this is important as we think about um, like what's my role, like what's my daily work in this? And what is the organization or what must the organization do to advance equity uh, within Chicago public schools? And how do we make sure that we're not having racialized outcomes? So at the, when you all presented um, the idea of, let's talk about inequities and you, you gave the example of Whitney Young and I forgot the other school, that's just, those are the same questions we're asking. Like how do we disrupt that some young people are doing well within the system and some young people are not. And what's our role um, in disrupting those inequities? So the Office of Equity um, exists for this mission, develop, support, and implement, and report on district efforts to eliminate the opportunity gaps in the quality of education and the policies we have and the supports for students and adults. And we say students and adults because we believe if you transform the student experience in school, you can change the outcome. And so that means adults need support in the, um, not just accountability, but how do we support people in doing the transformational work? Here are some of the committees that my team sits on. So when we look at policies around SQRP and school ratings, um, what do those policies look like? Are those policies racist or do they uphold racism? Do they uphold injustice? How do we look for that? How do we examine the criminal background check process? How do we think about, um, the executive success roadmap, which is about how do we ensure that kids have access to college and opportunities? What does that mean? How do we look at literacy within the organization at which um, students have opportunities um, to really, really develop strong reading, writing, thinking skills, and which students 
need more support? And how do we think about that as an organization and teacher development and those things? So what you see here are some of the steering committees that my team and I sit on. And our work has been um, impacting multiple spaces within the org. So when we think about the capital investments, where did the 600 plus million dollars go? How do we ensure that um, if we're fixing up schools or adding or um, strengthening um, the technology layout in those schools, how do we make sure that the money is distributed equitably? How do we make sure that the money is getting to um, places that need, um, that have critical needs and how do we responsive to that? And also, how do we make sure that students um, have the best people in front of them? And that, that's a part of like teacher development, that's a part of the workforce. Um, and so we provided some extra funding, like $44 million to schools that have been historically underserved. So with that, um, I'm gonna switch gears just for a second to let you know, if you go to equity.cps.edu, this is a website, a public facing toolkit um, that I might spend some time after questions if we have time. Um, but the public facing toolkit so that anyone can go and download the CPS equity framework, it's available for anyone. The progress page will continue to let us know where are we making progress and we have some more information coming. If you ever want to read stories about um, teachers and principals who are working in the system, who we call equity champions, you can see their stories. There are tools and supports to talk about anti-racist practices, um, to talk about resource allocation, um, and tools that were co-developed by some teachers and some that we um, have collected from all over the place that have been very helpful. And then some of the groups and then some of the events. Um, and you can also, if you share the website with someone, you can let them know, um, they can translate the language. So if they want to, if they have a, a different language that they speak, Spanish, simple Chinese, Filipino, um, et cetera, they can choose and select the language. And so even though the framework is a, like a physical document, it's also um, translated within this frame right here. So that's all like big infrastructure thinking. I'm not gonna push us further into the CPS equity framework and what it believes. If you see the gray space behind you, I'm sorry, not behind you, um, behind the colored image, it's called targeting universalism. And targeting universalism says, we have to set high goals for everyone, every student by race, by gender, by class, by socioeconomic background, and make sure that we set the goal as the same for everyone and figure out what are the targeted structures and solutions that have to be created? What are the systems that have to be changed in order to get people to that goal? The reason why we use targeting universalism is because we need to avoid um, creating low expectations for different groups of students. At the end of the day, we wanna make sure that all young people do well, and we have to figure out what's the accelerated path to close those opportunity gaps. And we said, that's the truth. Um, the four dimensions, these four colors represent the CPS equity lens. Liberatory thinking is about how do we address issues of our mindsets, anti-racist practices, what do we think about culture and responsive education. Inclusive partnerships is about who has a seat at the table, who must have a seat at the table. Resource equity is about where resources are now, where should they be. And fair policies and systems is about how do we ensure that policies don't benefit one group and burden another. And we say for every equity challenge, whether we're talking about literacy, whether we're talking about school quality, we have to um, enact the CPS equity lens in order to solve whatever that current equity issue is. So one example would be um, if we're trying to figure out literacy in a school, what are the policies that are disrupting that? What resources are needed to support those teachers in those schools? What are the mindset shifts that we have to um, really talk about? What are the conversations we need to have about what we believe people are capable of? And how do we involve parents and students in the process of supporting them with literacy? So all of those things are critically important. And are our policies fair? Are we measuring the right things? And so we believe that if we take every uh, equity issue, everything we're struggling with, everything we're trying to move on as an organization, through the equity lens, we can start to get at what's being solved. We actually have teachers who are using the equity lens in their classroom. Um, one teacher, um, she asked herself this, this question around fair policies and systems. 
thinking about which students benefit or which students get to pass out the paper and which students don't. It was a, a way of thinking that I just, I was like, right, that's a system within the classroom. So who gets to participate? Who gets to move around? Well, I know we're in virtual spaces now, so it's a little different. But who gets to have those roles and responsibilities in the classroom and which students do not? So that is the equity lens that we're using to mitigate and solve the problems um, and issues we're facing within the organization. So let me stop there around infrastructure um, and see if there are questions just around how we're set up as an organization, the way we're approaching these challenges um, before I start to get into some granular things. Yeah, there were some comments and like a question or two in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if the if they're, they're answered or not. So if you if you want to uh, elaborate further or just ask Dr. Swinney, uh, you know, please go ahead and and unmute yourself. Well, this is Jerry Johnson. I was just curious. Uh, as examples of who the members of all those steering committees are, are they? just staff and CPS or others? Yeah, it's a mix. Um, some of those, for example, for the, like the criminal background check, the work that we're doing, um, we don't have community members in those spaces because sometimes it's sensitive and personal information. So like there's, there's data sharing protocols. Um, but what we've done as the Office of Equity is go out and talk with people around what the criminal background check process is and how might we think about ensuring that those um, people who are connected to their families who have um, issues or sort of wrapped in the social in the um, justice system. I'm trying not to use uh, dehumanizing language. So um, like people who have criminal backgrounds, maybe to, to some to no fault of their own, like how do we think about that? And how do we support recidivism? How do we support justice work so that they have access um, to participate in school life. So those are some of the things we're solving for thinking through. Okay. Thank Maurice, you. earlier you put up a slide about stakeholders. Could you put that up again, please? One second. I'm not sure which slide. Let's see. But, or maybe uh, you were just talking about the stakeholders. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can, let me show you the slide that I didn't talk about that, that gets that more stakeholder um, mm -hmm. engagement is, here we go. Um, this is one of the tools in the CPS equity framework that really talk about how to um, involve or engage stakeholders. What we found um, let me let you answer your question before I tell you. Yeah, what I'm well, yes, when you were going through the list of stakeholders, I didn't hear you mention taxpayers. Um, I would think that that's an overarching group. Who who are you considering when you say taxpayers? When I say taxpayers, I mean people who pay taxes in the city of Chicago, businesses and individuals. And it may be an overarching group, but I think it would be uh, a lot more inclusive and effective to specifically name taxpayers as a stakeholder because they are so important to the whole system. And there are other, and there are stakeholder, there are taxpayers who are not involved in the system other than through the fact that they pay taxes to support it. I would want to know more about what that means for you in order to, I think taxpayers are included. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, to be honest with you. Yeah, what I mean is that uh, we need to be respectful of taxpayers who are funding this thing. Otherwise, we're not going to have any taxpayers. And to not list them as a separate group is disrespectful to taxpayers. And it also kind of shuts them out of the whole process of making sure that the system works. Because it's not going to work if we don't have respect for the taxpayers. I think everyone is a taxpayer. I'm, I'm not sure how you can, you can say that about every group though. I mean, you can say just about every, every one of these groups overlaps with other groups, but we're identifying the other groups separately. What I think we should do is add taxpayers uh, as a stakeholder because they clearly are as a group, a very important uh, group of stack, uh, stakeholders in this whole system. 
I think taxpayers are already included. You would have to expound and, and help me to understand how you say that taxpayers are not. Uh, because there's no, when we're going through the list of groups of stakeholders, you can go to specific groups and say, what's your input in the system? But we're not saying we're going to go specifically to taxpayers. What's your uh, view of how this should work? So we should, we should have them identified also as a separate group uh, in uh, this system if we're going to uh, make progress in making sure the whole system works and is functional going forward. I think it would be uh, constructive to do that. That's all I'm going to say. All right. I'm on this committee. I think we need to let him move forward and you can work with the committee later. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca. I would like to ask if CHA uh, or any entity in the city that uh, talks about housing and the uh, environment in which our youngsters try to go to school are involved directly as a uh, uh, task force or some kind of a uh, you know group that works with you all. Yeah, Melissa Navarro, who is a part of the who's um, she is before Melissa Navarro, who is working on a lot of the housing work uh, within the city, um, who is leading that charge. She and I have been working um, even before or at the very beginning of this equity work to think about. How do we provide stabilized housing and, and also transportation as another group? Um, there is something forthcoming around how do city agencies um, galvanize or sort of come together to support families? Because as a former principal, um, even when young people were doing well, if someone was had an eviction notice or lost their job and didn't have stable housing, it impacted their educational experience. Um, that's a good question. I think if you ask me that in a few months, I can give you more details about what specifically um, is happening. But there is something we're talking about behind the scenes right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're, uh, we're good to move on. Okay. Um, just to give, I'm going to jump ahead here. Since we're talking about taxpayers and housing, I want everybody to look at this slide here. This was developed by UIC, um, who has developed what we call the UIC, Econ I'm sorry, Economic Hardship Index. And the whole purpose of this was to help people understand essentially the darker the red, the greater their inequities within the system. That means that less access on the opportunity, so, um, Rebecca, as you think about housing, one of the indicators were families that lived in double, that live in double up housing um, are more in the darker red areas. Um, life expectancy is included in this. And so I included the link. I'll drop the link in the chat once I'm off of the uh, screen. And UIC is actually working on developing another one. We're actually in the CPS Office of Equity working with the Kerwin Institute and a few other people uh, as we think about what would a a core CPS opportunity index look like and how will we think about that. But I show people this data because there are some assumptions about um, like what access do people have, what are the resources that people have, and we will look at investment in the city. The darker red communities have been historically disinvested, have been historically underserved. Um, it is well documented in multiple places. I think UIC is one of the uh, universities within the city that takes a look at this. A lot of this was based on census data. Um, and so we know because different communities have historically had less, um, it is important that when we talk about equity that we are investing in places that have been historically underserved. And I can give you a long history. I'm sure you can probably, um, you probably know a lot of the Chicago history. Um, but we have to ask questions. Why have communities been historically underserved? Um, the Metropolitan Planning Council has done a lot of work in this work. I can't remember the name of the reports, but if you put in Metropolitan Planning Council, I call it the orange report and the green report. I just remember the color of the books, but I don't remember the title of those documents, but they help to give understanding around um, why it's important to have systemic investment into these places. 
Uh, Dr. Sweeney, I just have a quick question about that. Uh, hopefully it's quick. I, I, this is a fascinating map and I suspect others are interested in this too. I noticed though that in the city of Chicago, the lowest hardship index look, appears to be 8.6. Are there other communities in the Chicago region that would be uh, you know, lighter in color on the map uh, than you see here in the city of Chicago? No, I think um, what they did was sort of created a range of like one to a hundred. Um, and what this says is like, there is no community that has zero hardship. Um, so to eliminate that thinking, um, the first or the earliest signs of hardship come with 8.6, as we think about um, probably closer, or maybe that's the loop area a little further down, but closest to the lake. And so you can see um, this link that I had that I'll drop in the chat gives greater detail about what all of these um, indicators mean and how they were evolved. And then soon um, they will produce another one that I'll have a chance to see soon as a preview. Okay. And uh, as, I guess as long as we're on the map here, um, Rebecca, did you want to ask your question or should we move on? You're on mute. Yeah. Okay, I thought, I, thought I'd unmuted it. Um, does school funding vary depending on property taxes? That is, do schools in the light beige areas like Lakeview and Lincoln Park receive more funding because property taxes there are higher? Um, sometimes, so with student-based budgeting, there's the mix of, well, there are multiple funding streams. So there's the capital investment funding that could be anything from like building a school, renovations. There's a student-based budgeting, which is like the per pupil count. There are friends of accounts where families um, donate money to certain schools. And so when we say that schools um, that probably are in the, the lighter colors, they, get, they have gotten a greater percentage of, of all of those things. So that's a part of it. So the more students you have, the more money you have. Um, but also with that, there are other ways that people, that what I will call supplemental ways of providing education and friends of is one of those ways. I know the difference between like Cicero and um, New Trier, which uh, you know, is not in Chicago, is something like five to $6,000 per pupil per year. And I just wonder if there's that disparity among the Chicago public schools as well. There is, um, there is every student in the org, in the, in the system has a baseline of like, maybe I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a round it out and just say five grand um, per student that is um, taking out operating costs, et cetera. Um, and when we look at some of our neighboring districts around Chicago, some of them can be up to 12,000. So the, the state is, call for evidence-based funding is something we're looking into um, in CPS. And we've also had some community meetings back in January, February, um, where we were learning and just talking with different communities and families around the city to talk about funding formulas and ways. And so we got a lot of learning from that. Advance Illinois is also actively involved in tracking funding from the state and federal levels, because we do believe that government also has to play a bigger role um, so there are multiple ways in which we're looking at to ensure that we get more funding to um, schools, especially in the darker red communities. But Chicago itself is $2 billion underfunded, and that's one of the reasons why we are championing, championing funding in the city. Thank you. So a part of our work, you're welcome. So a part of our work is in the Office of Equity to present a strong case for equity within the city um, and outside of the city. Um, we believe that we have to be strong advocates for funding. So a lot of the work of the Office of Equity is really about um, systems correction and infrastructure. So for us, the, the lighter definition, um, we have much more in the definition in the framework itself. Um, but CPS, um, Office of Equity, or we define equity in Chicago Public Schools as championing the individual cultures, identities, talents, abilities, language, and interests of each student by ensuring they receive the necessary opportunities and resources to meet their unique needs and aspirations. 
So we believe that whether our child um, is black, white, Latinx, LGBTQ, um, low income, immigrant families, however young people come to us, we believe that it is a human, like we talked about, a human right and moral obligation to ensure that they receive the opportunity that they need um, within the system. And that is something we're always working toward every single day. So I'm not gonna do this activity that I have. I was gonna have you download the framework and do a lot of stuff. Um, I see we're cutting close on time, so I wanna make sure that there are time for questions. But I do wanna say uh, within the framework, there are ways um, that we help to make the framework usable for families. So while we, for families and communities and teachers, so while we as an organization are examining all of our policies right now to make sure that they're more equitable, while we are working on um, a different funding formula and advocating for additional funding um, from government, et cetera, um, while we are looking at our school rating policy, there are these what I call big buckets of work. We also believe that equity happens at the classroom level with teachers and with young people. With students by giving them voice in the change process and with teachers by giving them voice and providing supports for their own um, development. So what would it mean for me as a black male teacher to be in a multiracial classroom? What would it mean for someone to be a white female teacher um, teaching black and brown students? And how do we think about helping people to recognize that the way we show up, our backgrounds, our histories, our cultures and identities are coming with us into that classroom and that in some ways they might be in conflict with what we want for our young people and what they experience from us. And so the framework, um, like that slide I showed in the beginning, is about the individual, the interpersonal, and the institution level um, to enact change. Um, and this is one of the, when we talk about stakeholder engagement, or stakeholder um, participation, one of the things that we heard very early on was, you know, there's a lot of, when CPS says that it is involving, um, you know, stakeholders, it doesn't feel that way, we're not involved. And so what we did in the Office of Equity is clarify what all these terms mean. So for example, excuse me, if I said that we are asking parents and partners to collaborate, under this collaborate right here, it says to partner with stakeholders in each aspect of the decision, including developing alternative solutions and identify the preferred solution. So if we're not doing that, then we need to avoid saying the word collaborate and choose the most appropriate word for what we're trying to do. And that is going to help us continue to build trust. And the Office of Equity uh, teams with the Office of Faith, which is family and community uh, engagement, to ensure that we're using the appropriate language and we're going to continue to develop and get stronger at this over time. Um, and just a couple of things about anti-racist practices. We've been having conversations with principals and really talking about what does it mean to be anti-racist. Um, we don't hold that there is a race neutral. We talk about this in the framework when we talk about racial equity. And so Abram Kendi, um, once again, talking about what's the individual work, he says, an anti-racist is one who is expressing the idea that racial groups are equal and none needs developing. And is supporting policies that um, reduces racial inequities. Being an anti-racist requires persistent self-awareness self-criticism and self-examination. And so we believe that this is an anchor in this work for equity because we not only like to say equity, we believe it's equity um, and racial equity. And so in the CPS equity framework, we say targeted universalism is the approach, set high goals for everyone, we're solving for racial equity, um, and then we use the CPS equity lens to help us advance the work. And then there's this whole piece about anti-blackness. I'll send the link to this um, for you, Ira. There's a great video that really talks by Kimberly Jones. It has some expletives in it. So there's a clean version on YouTube somewhere, but she really does a good job with talking about um, the 400 year, 400 year history of America and um, through the monopoly. It's phenomenal. It's, it's, I've watched it a, a thousand times, not literally a thousand times, but a thousand times. Um, and there are some activities, um, if you all wanted to take this up, 
I, I can set up a time with you to talk about some activities that help to support uh, anti-racist practices. Great. But one of the things we talk about were just words like black list, black eye, black mood, black magic, how the word black has forever been associated with bad. And that's a way, that's something in our brains that we have to constantly disrupt. How do we not think of the term black as being negative? Um, and how do we work on that schema within our own minds? So with that, it's 10, 12. I wanna be respectful of your time, so I'm gonna turn it back to Ira and I can answer questions. If you have specific questions about what CPS is doing on, on any front, I can answer those. And I can go over time if I need to. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we had a, if, if somebody asked you a question, if you could share your contact information, uh, if, we have, if they have additional questions for you uh, yeah. personally, maybe share that in the chat if you wish, or if there's another way to contact you. Um, I will do that. And uh, Jerry, I'll try to get to you in a bit, but we have other people asking questions. So if, if That's you don't fine. mind. Um, Melanie, do you wanna expand upon your question? Uh, Mr. Sweeney, I'm actually a high school teacher in CPS, and I'm curious. I, I, I'm grateful for your work. Thank you so much. And I just want as many people to see this um, as they can. I'm curious about, and I don't even mean if I'm using the wording incorrectly, but I believe in all these systemic inequities. And even that when a child enters into kindergarten, they've already started. And so is what, I mean, is it most effective to, you know, take, try to help out as soon as possible? I mean, like as a high school teacher, I feel like I have this issue that can happen that by the time we get them in ninth grade, we see them so, so large. And I, I teach at Whitney Young, and even at Whitney Young, I see the inequities of an incoming freshman. Mm -hmm. And it's literally about, I mean, there's so many things. And so is there data that shows in your work or just experience, since you have so much of like, where can we, where can we help the most? You know, like what, what helps the most? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, shout out to high school. Um, I was a high school principal, so I get it. And in your lens around what is happening, and I was a ninth grade principal for a while too, so I know exactly, um, to some degree, I have a lot of connections there. I do believe that early, early literacy is the way that we solve a lot of this. Um, I recently had a conversation with Dr. Flemings, who's over literacy, and she's developed a framework and more information is coming out about that soon we have um, a new chief of early literacy, Brian um, Stokes. And so we just had a, what we call an early literacy collaborative meeting. Because a part of this, um, to your point, is around how do we ensure that teachers who are teaching have the background in reading? I was an English teacher and I learned to be a reading teacher. And I learned because when I was in college, one of my best friends couldn't read and I didn't know it. Um, and that forever sort of rocks my core. And so I had to, I received training in like um, success for all, direct instruction, um, my favorite letters training. And I actually think high school teachers can benefit um, from that. And so just email me and let's keep talking because there, there is something there, there is an opportunity there. Um, but we have to, we have to do two things. We have to get the early literacy strong and tight and that's what we're working on. I, just, I wish we could move quicker. Um, and then at the same time, what's happening for people who've sort of passed that K3, pre-K3 stage and how do we think about that? Um, but I do believe that that is the strongest access. And to um, Rebecca's point, one of the reasons why stable housing is important is because if young people don't have stable housing, even with, the, with strong teachers, young people move and I'm sure you've seen that as a as a high school teacher and that that has happened to me as a principal um so thank you for that my email is in the chat great and Susan Graham did you, did you want to ask your question if you want to go on sure, up sure. um I, I just was uh, one of your earlier slides were talking about partnerships and I'm familiar with the Loyola University School of Ed they partner with CPS particularly at the Sen High School. And I'm, I'm wondering how uh, successful partnerships with, other, with uh, School of Ed's universities in the city um, 
are working with CPS and if that helps the equity um, issues or is going in that direction, I know that's their goal and I'm just wondering how that's working. And what was the organization, repeat that for me? It was Loyola uh, University, uh, the School of Ed. Got it. Um, I had a conversation with Loyola University School of Ed about a month ago, and we will be following up soon. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, yeah, I don't mean just that university. I mean, have you looked into having partnerships with other universities, and, and how is that working? Yeah, I will say that the partnerships with universities um, doesn't sit in the Office of Equity right now, even though I have partnerships with U of C, with the Consortium and Research. So I'm a part of a research steering committee to make sure we're looking at the right data, um, collaborating on that data. Um, we've been talking with um, UIC, like so for example, some of the interns we're having. I will say it's not coordinated in the way that I would want it to be, but I think in terms of research it is. But I, but I, I do think there's greater opportunity for greater partnerships, or they might exist in other CPS offices and I just not know it. I get it, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jane, Jane Anderson, do you want to ask your question? Do you want to go off of mute if you want? Oh, uh, yes. I'm wondering what tools you are using to measure the effectiveness of your work. Yeah, good question. So we are actually developing what we call um, a theory of change. Some, so some of it is, did we improve the way we allocated funding, right? So when we looked at how funding was done in 2018 and 2019 and now 2020, do we find us looking at communities that have been historically underserved and are they getting more funding to, to eliminate um, some of the equity gaps that we see? So that, that there is one way. Um, we're also taking a different approach. So we're looking at what we call proxy measures in the Office of Equity that we're starting to establish. And what that means is like, we can look at the outcome when it comes out, but the question that we're asking is, are we putting the right inputs in place to get to the outcome we want? Um, and I think that's a, a gap that we have to solve for. So like, when we say grades or teachers or like, do we give teachers the right support that they need to do the thing that we're asking them to do? And then if we did, how do we measure that? So there are multiple ways. Um, and we've been talking with you of C um, to help us to think about what are some ways to measure equity. And we've been looking at other districts like Oakland. Um, Austin is figuring that out. So there are some ways in which we measure our work that way. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, Donna has a question about parental engagement. Yep. Do you want to expand upon that? Yes. My question is, <clears throat> I so believe in early literacy. Mm -hmm. My question is, how are you involving parent engagement? Because we know it begins at the very youngest ages. And reading, reading together helps that process of increasing literacy. Yeah, um, two things, email me. And the reason why I say that is because I'm pulling together people who have a deep concern and love for early literacy to get more feedback. I recently had a conversation with um, black mothers and black female caregivers around what literacy supports are needed and how do we need to think about literacy now that we're in this virtual community. Um, and people are saying, you know, it'll be helpful in from anything with like children's books, partnership with Chicago Library, um, digital systems. So we're solving for some of that right now. But I, I believe we have to honestly have a literacy campaign within the city, if I could have one. Um, that's sort of the big lofty goal, because I think we need to center literacy in the life of the city, if that makes sense. Um, and I would love to get some thoughts and ideas from you on how we can approach that and how do we support families with that. Like I still believe the book swaps are helpful even though I know I've seen the, some of those in different parts of the city on the north side. I dropped off a book and picked up a book and I think there's so many ways with like children's books, like very, very simple ways that, that are not cost effective that we could be solving for some of this now. So I would love to get some input and feedback. Will do. 
Great. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. Um, Claudia, do you want to raise your question? Are you there? You want to unmute? Oh, I, I didn't have a question, Ira. Or a comment. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, I thought you had a question. No. Okay. Okay. Cla Sorry. Claudia unmuted whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. You're another, another Claudia. Claudia. Yeah. Another Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, am I on or is yes, the other yes, Claudia you I want to ask? Okay. I'm yeah, going back to my question so I can actually read what I wrote. Um, so, Maurice, um, we as individuals, this is so big and it's so complicated. I'm talking about, you know, inequities. What can we as individuals do other than vote to try to support you all in your work and move the system in direction of an anti-racism focus? Thank you. Um, that's a solid question. And um, I'm gonna go back. First, I'm gonna do one. I'm gonna say something, but I want you to see it on the slide. Next, I'm gonna get a different slideshow. Part of it, I think, is doing what we call the internal work of understanding um, how are we showing up in relationship to the people around us. So one small example that I do for myself is I don't walk past Black boys without saying, hello, good morning, how are you? Um, because the interactions that we have with people make the largest difference in the world. Um, and I have been a principal in a school in this urban community. I've been in a majority white school in the rural South in Louisiana. And I tell you the, the way in which we engage or interact with people sits at the core of all things. And so I think that is a part of it. Um, so like what's the kind of do right now that you can do right now, I would say that. And then the other part I think is advocating for <clears throat> or figuring out what are some ways to maybe as a church look at which one of the schools in your community in your church community needs additional resources around literacy i think there are ways in which groups of people can come together and say hey school we are interested in supporting something how might we be of service and help um, i think that for me even when I think about my time at ORU, when we would do these small little things, it created such love and warmth and connection to people who are closest to us that I think sometimes um, we miss those opportunities. Um, I think those are two small ways of getting started. And I think having conversations about race and so Chicago, Chicago Beyond, it's on actually on the, the equities toolkit under anti-racist. Um, anti-bias but Chicago Beyond has ways in which because I could even come back and talk about you know what it means to have anti-racist conversations and how to navigate those spaces um, but I think we have to have more conversations with our friends and our family to really understand what's happening I think there is a there's a missing gap in um, what people understand racism to be like a lot of times we think it's the raw or it's the people who are fighting and cussing and, and those things. Racism shows up in policy. It shows up in inner, it shows up in very small, subtle ways, like microaggressions in different ways that we need to really take some time and interrogate. Maurice, I have a, I have a question. Um, in terms of curriculum, um, I don't know if you, if you have a finger in that pie, but to the extent you do, are there, uh, are there examples or a good example of something that is being taught in whatever grade level that really needs to be rethought? You know, like, you know, I don't know if the lost cause, uh, you know, uh, theory is still be, is, is being, you know, alluded to in high school history classes and stuff like that. But have you, have you, do you continue to find evidence of, things that are being taught in the classroom that are just like not cool anymore? Um, I will say, yes. You know, my, my earliest example is I think we need to stop teaching cowboys and Indians. Um, for example, 
that people were sitting at the table with the turkey and, and love and that's, that's not the true history of America when we think about indigenous people. Um, I've been having a lot of conversation with um, the American Indian Association. Um, there's a group called Facing History that does a lot of work around how do we need to understand American history in a larger context. Um, and our textbooks are written in very white Eurocentric ways. And I think we got to really, really talk about like what is the fullness of American history uh, slavery is usually a small chapter. It's very, I've, you know, in my principal days, one day um, I went through literally all of the textbooks to just see what they were teaching about slavery. And it was like this little sliver. And we know that slavery um, was an economic means of helping America get the wealth that she has now. And we don't talk about any of that. And so we have to disrupt the way history is taught. I think Facing History does a phenomenal job we're pulling in resources and stories. Um, and we're working on what's called the Curriculum Equity Project in the district, where we are building curriculum um, around more culturally sustaining and responsive education. Um, that's happening. Thank you. And then there was a question about how these programs are functioning during the pandemic restrictions. Is there, do you have anything to add about COVID in particular and what challenges you're facing and what you're doing? I mean, you know, we, there was an early vision around wanting young people back in schools to be connected to teachers physically um, in the space with relationships. We know that, that, was, that that's not where we are right now. Um, I think that's the real challenge. Um, there is something about proximity and relationships um, that really help to drive um, and foster strong community, especially um, for young people who are, who are needing more access and opportunity. Um, but we'll figure it out. I think, you know, we want people to wear masks and keep, keep clean, stay safe, whatever the, the appropriate terms are around that, so that we could find ways to have potentially hybrid models to have connections. But we will only act based on the science to make sure that we're not putting you know, that we don't know life, we don't want any lives lost, of course. So I think that's the greater challenge around COVID. And, you know, I think for me personally, um, the early literacy is a challenge I keep thinking about in this COVID space. It is, it's something that we got to figure out. And that we're working on it. Unfortunately, I want it to be done like that. And it's just, I can't have my way in that way especially in a bureaucracy like CPS. Um, there's quite a few comments uh, congratulating you on your PhD. I know that there are many people on the call who are educators themselves or have been educators. And we also got the word out to uh, tutoring, volunteer tutoring organizations. So I hope that there are some volunteer tutors and others who are in that space on this call. We appreciate all your work with that. And uh, hopefully this call today, this uh, uh, class today uh, is elaborated on, you know, what, what CPS is doing around these areas. And now we know about those resources and the go-to guy, <laughs> Dr. Swinney, if you have any other questions or whatever. Um, I think with that, we'll kind of call this to a, uh, an informal close. If, if, if Dr. Swinney, if you want to stay on a couple of more minutes, kind of recreate the uh, go up to the teacher after class, and we can't, I don't know if we can make it private, but um, to the extent that folks want to stay on and raise other points or ask questions, we can maybe spend a few more minutes on that. But uh, otherwise, uh, we have a nice fall day out there today, uh, not to mention uh, worship at 11 o'clock. So, um, Thank you all for joining us again next week is our final session in this topic. And uh, we appreciate the work of the uh, uh, Equity and Education Committee uh, at Fort Church for organizing this. So again, thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Ira. Thank you. Thank you. Ira, thank you for thank putting you. this together. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I just uh, kind of yeah. closed it out, uh, but... Um, Janet, who's on the call, did a lot, and uh, I know there's a lot of activity at the church around these issues, so I encourage you all to get in touch and uh, keep, keep working on them. 
and show up to that October discussion about the tax amendment. Maurice, I had another question. Yeah. So uh, on that map that you showed with all the disparities, uh, obviously there are a lot of disparities in different neighborhoods in Chicago, and there's a lot of focus on getting money to the students. What about letting students go to the money by letting their parents choose what school their kids attend? Yeah, my philosophy on that and Dr. Jackson's is that every student should have a high quality school in his or her neighborhood um, so that young people don't have to travel. When we looked at some of the travel rates for some students, um, some young people can are traveling like an hour and 90 minutes. That's, three, that's two to three hours out of a day um, that students are, I'm gonna say losing or could be used in um, local sports programs, local um, arts programs and writing. And so there's a lot of time, what we consider time loss through travel. And so we want to avoid now, we do know that there are some cases where certain programs are offered in different places. And so if I want a particular program, um, the hours or the time used to travel might, you know, not seem egregious to me as a student. Um, but we want, and also by investing um, in communities or in, I'm gonna say school buildings and programs, it increases the property value and tax value of people who are living in those communities which allows for you know, the, the side effect of having more equity in your home and it creates more opportunities. And so we believe like when we look at um, the new Englewood STEM school, it has created, you know, there's a health clinic in the school. It has created so many benefits um, for that community. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Swinney, but we actually kind of do have a system of choice that if a family really wants to, yeah. They can try to find another place and it has to do with, you know, lottery or this or that or whatever. I mean, that's like a whole other conversation that I'm sure your office is often involved in. But I don't know. I mean, I think you know that, Mr. Kimfield, but like if if a family really wants to pursue a school outside of their neighborhood, yeah. there's a lot of systems in place for them to right now, right? And it just seems to me like that should be up to the parents, not the system saying you have to go to school. So, uh, and yeah, I agree that uh, it would be great if we had great schools in every neighborhood. That's the ideal. But we're a long way from that. And, and a, a way to fix that in the short term would just be let parents decide whether the travel is worth it to their particular kid. They're the best ones to make that decision. They do make that decision now. But we know systemically, if you've been in an underserved or disinvested community, a part of the reason why um, some people are in these predicaments is because of lack of investment. And so we believe that people should have opportunity in their neighborhoods. Um, and that is the first, because even when you look at where some schools are now, some, some young people don't have to walk very far at all. Um, mm -hmm. It's around the street or down the corner, or they have parents who can drive them to certain places. Um, but when we look at students who are traveling, it's usually by bus and train and walking. So the distance um, and the routes to school, um, but we, we want to make sure that we, and, and you know, part of the reason why we're looking at school performance policies is because um, we need to make sure that every school that has, you know, when I look at the data, I'm looking, I'm disaggregating the data by race, gender, um, ethnicity, like multiple data cuts. And what I'm seeing is even some of our highest performing students, for example, in University of Chicago produce data that say, you know, some of our black and brown students are going to some selective schools, for example, with 4.0s and, and those GPAs are not being maintained. And there, there, there are multiple reasons why that's happening. And it's not all on the student. Uh, we've learned a lot from young people about, you know, sometimes it takes a long time to get to school. I'm sleepy. Sometimes I feel like I'm not wanted. Like there are all of these things that young people say that we have to solve for. Um, but we, we totally believe that if we want to increase property value and opportunity within communities, we have to invest in those communities. Well, Dr. Swinney, getting back to that point, I mean, I think that that's the idea behind, as Melanie said, the idea behind the magnet schools and the selective enrollment schools, but it just seems to me that there aren't enough magnet schools to go around, and there's certainly not enough selective enrollment schools to go around 
And I guess my question about magnet schools, which Dennis basically is a school can open itself up to anyone who lives in the district, but then there's a lottery that is involved. You can't accept everyone. So, I mean, there's a school, for example, in our neighborhood, we live in Albany Park, Lincoln Square, and it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a highly regarded school. It's not a magnet school. The only way to get into that school is to live in the district or maybe get one of a handful of principal discretions, which I think is rare if, if not non-existent. So it, what, what, what is involved, you know, kind of in a nutshell in determining when a school can become a magnet school and is that up to the school itself or does the district say you're going to be a magnet school or? I think I, I would want to unpack what all of that means in terms of magnet selective enrollment. Cause I think there's a byproduct of people thinking that the other people who are in different schools aren't doing a great job. There's an assumption around, there are so many economic factors that are also playing out that are contributing to school quality. I mean, there, there is a lot of, there's a lot happening. Um, and we have to solve for like more clinicians in schools, um, more supports for families. And I, one of the things that we are, that I and my team are figuring out um, are what are all of the systems that could create more stabilization for families um, within the city? And that has to be at the core of it. Um, around economics, education, I say expungement, which is work around criminal justice. As we know, um, there's a disproportionality around those um, people who have been incarcerated or who are incarcerated. Um, there, there's a lot, there's just a lot. Um, but I wanna get back to the core of the school being in those communities. And if teachers need more support, I wanna support teachers. Um, Cause I actually want people to stay in communities. Like when teachers go, when teachers came to teach at Tilden or when they go to Englewood or Little Village or just wherever in, in the city, people are going to those spaces believing that they can make the change and help to support. And I want to support people who are doing this tough work. That's, that's my view on it now. The, one question came up in the chat that we didn't get time to answer, but to the extent that you recruit teachers from uh, diverse backgrounds. Um, what, are, do you have any specifics or if anything to add about that? Are you involved in that or is that another part of CPS? Partially, we've been talking about a few things. It's, it's usually the Office of Talent, but in the CPS five-year vision, we made some commitments around increasing the number of uh, black and brown uh, teachers within the city. A part of that too is um, there are multiple ways of like recruiting. So we've been talking, I think actually they might have already been starting to go into historically black colleges and universities. There's also, um, we've been talking about pipeline work. So I was a student who was in high school that was interested in education. And so here I am like a long time, you know? Um, and one of my teachers, Ms. Strickland and Ms. Murray, two of those people who Hope to push me into teacher education programs. You know, I still talk to them to this day saying thank you. Um, and so I think there's some pipeline work that has to continue that we're building out. And then we've had a number of, we have a program in CPS where some of our paraprofessionals are working on degrees to become teachers. So we're, we're addressing it from multiple angles. And if you have any other great ideas, I'd love to hear them to continue to do that. Yeah, the HBCUs is a good mm -hmm. source, I would imagine. And, but, what, I yeah. would, what I've observed that I would hope that somewhere happened in CPS is like that, so you talk about equity, it feels like there's programs that certain schools might do because their school chooses to do it. Mm -hmm. And I wish that like a little part of your program existed in every school. And so that like, it wasn't a choice around, because there's a couple of things that, Whitney Young does that we are trying, that they've always, I won't say always, what I understand is they've tried to do it, but the local school is choosing to do it. 
probably because they don't need to put the money elsewhere. You know, I mean, like, yeah. I know that, like, we don't need to put the money in, I'm going to just say something blanket that I is probably wrong, because I'm not administration, but like, we don't need as many security officers as someone else might need. Like, I'm going to make that up. I don't know that, but that's an easy blanket statement. And so we have a dedicated teacher who's a math tutor and a dedicated teacher who's a writing tutor. You know what I mean? And the, yeah. I know the locals, you probably know this, Mr. Bush, like the local school council dedicates to doing that. And I know that that's there specifically to help with the intent to specifically help students who might've come to the school in a different place. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it yeah. would be wonderful if we could afford to do that for all the high school. You know, you know, you know. Yeah. Yes. I'm and that's what, or like we have a math class that tries to accelerate kids because they didn't have it in their grade school. And that's directly for black and brown students, but that takes an entire math class from somewhere else. I wish all the schools could do, do you know what I mean? Like, and that's what I would hope that maybe your office, look, that's getting really detailed, but like, wouldn't that be amazing if just, it wasn't the local school's choice, but everybody, you know, is that, am I thinking of the right thing? Yeah, I think one of the, if I were to reframe what you're saying, I, I always say I haven't seen a bad school, but I've seen an under-resourced one. Um, and I believe if every school that, that one would say has not been successful by any measure, usually has less resources than the schools that we say are. Um, and to your point, like you think about when young people go to college in, in multiple universities, there are math centers, there are writing centers, there, there is a lot of this sort of wraparound services and that has to be the approach in education. And I, I think the, the country funds education horribly. And those are just two specific examples. I can say I was at XYZ Life and Roman School and they didn't do that and Whitney Young does it. And I think that's like an amazing thing the principal and the LSC decide to do, mm -hmm. but I wish everybody could, you know, or it's the same idea, like preschool at every grade school for everybody in the neighborhood. You know, I mean, I know those are really expensive things I'm mentioning, but like, I hope that those are the kinds of things that we're like, yeah. we can move to, I don't know. Yeah, Mel yeah, Melanie, from my experience, I mean, we're, we're at Whitney Young and we were at the Selective Enrollment Elementary School as well. And it seems like it's the parental involvement and the resources the parents have, I mean, I hardly have to be involved in the uh, the uh, 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 friends of Whitney Young or whatever because I know there are so many super talented, super resourced, super connected people who know how to fundraise, who know how to articulate what's needed, and you know there's got to be schools out there. I would imagine that you know the parents don't have that power. So I guess Maurice, my one question for you is how do you how do you interact with the parent communities at these under-resourced schools so that there's more of a grassroots, hey, we need this and this is what we're gonna do to get it. Yeah, um, and then I'm gonna pass it because I think Tracy and some other people had some things. I think um, a part of, there's a balance of like, we have a social and moral responsibility from an equity perspective that we just need to do it. And I think it, that, that, that employs political will and moral um, clarity around, if we say we love people and if we want the best for people and if we wanna ensure that young people have access to this beautiful country, then we have to do it. Um, and I will say we do a lot of listening from the Office of Equity, that's why we did what uh, the $44 million investment into um, positions for um, at least, I think it was a hundred schools that were, that we know we had disparity. In it. Right now it was at least a two year commitment while we do bigger solving for funding. So that's a part of it, um, Ira. But I, I will say we, we, you know, years ago, CPS did a 2020 campaign around equity and funding. And I think it's one of the things that we have to continue to do. Maurice, I need to log, but thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks, Dennis. Take care. So, uh, I'm Tracy Kugler. I actually am a pediatrician at the University of Chicago, so I know some. Of, I know a lot of the research data, in addition to taking care of many of these brown and black children on a daily basis. Um, 
one, I think one of the biggest issues that I'm not convinced people at Forth understand, well, there's two things. Number one, when the North side fundraises, there's people on the North side that can actually afford to work with the fundraiser, i.e. I have friends that their kids go to the North side schools and many of them say, well, you know, they ask for $500 for this and a thousand dollars for that. And my colleagues just pay it because they're like, it's still cheaper than sending them to a private school in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And my South side families can't do that. I wish they could. And then the other thing is IEPs. All of many of my friends who have kids at both private schools and public schools have IEPs for their children. They have paid for the, they have gone either through their private insurance or whatever for the neuropsychologist. And my understanding is, is that you can't even get IEPs for the children on the South side. And that messes up the funding for those schools as well as their educational process. And that's probably part of the reason why some of these kids get to these select high schools and are lost is because they haven't learned the skills that they would learn with an IEP before then. And I, I don't have any solutions, but I'm sure that's on your list of things that you're trying to do. Yeah, it's, um, we are working on the prioritized list of things to solve for. So, um, Diverse learner services is one of them. Because a lot of, I think what you're also saying, Tracy, is it has been my experience. I haven't seen this in the data, but many um, affluent families get IEPs to justify gifted learning um, and access and opportunity, which is different from um, that there might be learning disabilities, right? And so that I have seen that in multiple schools that I've worked in as a as a school administrator. Um, but I hear anecdotally that, but I, I don't want to say I know that definitively because I haven't done my due diligence by checking those numbers. I do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And mine is anecdotally too, but I hear what you're saying. Karen and Donna and Jerry, I see on mic unmuted or something. Yeah. Well, just yeah. one thing I'd like to add Mm -hmm. This is a, and I will email you this, out of our racism class online in August, we were encouraged, what can you imagine that would be different? My imagination is to empower small African-American churches. Our position would be to provide money, to provide books, and they would have children in K, first and second grade. And so we're working on that at Fourth Church, but I believe churches can be integral in saying, hey, education's important, let's read with our kids. And that would be the parental involvement. They could read one book every day for 10 minutes each week, for 10 weeks, that's free to them, I think it could make a difference. Yeah, I think small ways, small, you know, one way to solve something is small increments and bites and moving it at a time. I think churches, schools, and I, I'm making up this term, Keystone Small Businesses have been anchors of communities for so long. Like the store that everyone goes to, that everyone knows everybody, they have a lot of information. Um, barbershops is another place, um, you know, <laughs> I call that one of my therapy centers. Like I have a therapist, but the barbershop is also a place of relaxation for me. So there are multiple ways, but to your point, I do think there is a way to, to sort of draw connections. I really like that. So thank you for sharing that. Right. I want to go to one of those barbershops someday. I heard a lot about them and <laughs> never been to one where I feel like it's cheers or something. Got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it slowed down a lot since COVID, but, um, yeah. you know, my, my barber cuts anybody's hair. He's, he's phenomenal. What, you know, I'm just wondering, like with all this fundraising going on at the selective enrollments and the magnets and everything, like, would it make sense to kind of think about like a surcharge or a tax put on those fundraising efforts to 
go to under-resourced schools? Is that a, even a starter of an idea or would that just run into a brick wall of opposition or not do much? I mean, we've, I've, so there are two things. The school funding working group, what we heard from communities, even on the north side, um, are some ideas about how to spread the wealth of the friends of. And so exploring that is important. Um, we know that other districts have, it all comes into like a central pot and then it's dispersed from there. So there are multiple ways that people are thinking about that. Um, it's still probably in the being thought through um, to do that in an equitable way. So does, is CPS able to fundraise on its own or does it have a fundraising arm? Oh, uh, yes. Children's First Fund. Good question. Um, the Children's First Fund is the 501c3 for the district. And how is that going? Um, we're working on, we built out some strategies um, to anchor different people who want to fund different opportunities. So that's being narrowed right now. Mm -hmm. Gary? Yeah, you. just quick question. You, you mentioned earlier on about looking at different uh, formulas for funding. Does that include evidence-based? Yes, yes. Okay. Evidence-based is probably the number one I'll take the lead from the state. Yes, sir. Yeah. Aaron, you are unmuted. Did you have a question? Okay. Going to run to church. Thanks again, Maurice. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. If everyone's okay, I think I'll close this out. But uh, Maurice, thank you so much for spending time and extra time. You're, you're working off the clock now, so appreciate it. Thank you. Can I ask one more quick question? And it's just about the recruitment piece. I really want to see more um, black and brown and Asian, Asian and indigenous people like as teachers in all the schools. Mm -hmm. And as a per, I was a department chair at my former school. I help with hiring in my current one. And there's not a lot of people of color in the math and sciences. Like we literally try our best to find candidates that would fit at our school. And I don't know if it's that we have to, like you said, the pipeline thing and or supporting them once they're in the district so, so people are successful. And I know we want that with all teachers, but I think it's particularly hard for certain groups of teachers to feel supported. Is that another thing that we can yeah. be doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was looking at something that Evanston was doing or they might still be like hiring teams um, and training and help, helping hiring teams you know, part of it, I wonder if it's about implicit or explicit bias or, you know, I know. or cultural ways and understanding in the interview process. There's so many layers to that. Um, but but I'm think, talking even candidates. Let's not even say people who get hired. Yeah. But candidates in math and science are so low. It's hard to hire people when you don't have candidates. Yeah, I think the, the talent team is working on that specifically what they're doing. I would be lying if I said I knew, but I know it's... That's awesome. That's good to know. And it's okay. I didn't mean to take away. I just thought I'd give that to a sense because I think students seem um, themselves represented in their teachers is super important. So I think someone from Whitney Young reached out to us um, and maybe Liam Bird, my equity policy strategist, is talking with somebody at Whitney Young to talk about some of this work. Um, awesome. I don't remember who the person was. It's okay. I'm not responsible for any of it. I just want to <laughs> since, <laughs> yeah, since yeah. you're here. I'm so glad to meet you. Thank you. I would take Sorry. the same opportunities you are too. So no, I'm good. <laughs> Is it still a rule for teachers to live in um, in the city? It there is, are, but, but there are some exceptions. Um, like math and science special ed, I think, in foreign language. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. But it's about hiring when you're hired. Like I couldn't move, which I don't want to. I'm not trying to. I'm, but like an example is I couldn't move. But if I lived out of the district when I was hired, I could. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have thank you. Day. Take care. Have a good one, everybody. Well, thank you again, everyone. Thank and uh, we'll see uh, most of you, if not all of you, next week. All right.